Welcome to the Sacred Rebels podcast. This is your host, Tay. And co-host, Amy. We're the podcast that fearlessly dives into the depths of holistic healing. Join us as we empower you to embrace your divine journey, confront sexual trauma, conquer addictions, and rise with confidence with life after trauma. It's time to unlock the sacred rebel within and enter a transformative path to self-discovery and healing. We are here to trigger you. By shattering stigmas and questioning societal norms, join us as we explore diverse stories of men and women showcasing that there's not one way to heal and the importance of community. Together, we will navigate the evolving human experience, embracing paths to growth and understanding. Let's Let's heal, heal, baby. baby. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to another episode of Sacred Rebels. Um, I pulled our card tonight, and I will read it after we do our big deep breath. <clears throat> and Aim is going to give you the AA story, which is what we promised you guys last week. Experience, mm. strength, and hope from beginning to end. The real vulnerable, deep, dark shit that y'all have been begging to hear. So, Woo. But we're going to ground down first. Yep. Always start with our big deep breath. So one hand on the heart, one hand on the belly. Really expel all the energy out. Big inhale, lift up, rise up, fill up. Open the heart. And exhale, just release, let it go, surrender. Have an open mind. (laughs) I needed that more than you know. I love that gong so much. Oh, it's so good. Such a good addition. Yeah. BGE, baby. (laughs) Okay. The card I pulled is the moon's wisdom, take the lead. And it says, sometimes you just need to stand up for yourself. And this is one of those times. The sad truth is that in your current situation, if you continue to act like an ingenue, <laughs> is that what that says? <laughs> ingenue. Yeah. Or someone I'm who- I'm the dyslexic one, so yeah, who knows? <laughs> I'm like, look it up, guys. I don't know what that means. Or someone who feels less than, there are certain people who will exploit their power or authority over you. Mm -hmm. They do this because they have their own insecurities and they're trying to make themselves feel more powerful. So what do you do? You need to take the lead here to show the world that you're in control of yourself and whatever is happening around you. Step up and take authority. Be the boss. What do you need to do to turn the situation around in your favor? Do that. If you feel that there's nothing that you can do, then you're not trying hard enough. If you can't take practical steps, work on the situation energetically instead. Do this via meditating and seeing what your higher self tells you, creating a vision board or creatively visualizing the outcome that you seek. Believe in yourself. You've got this. You're wiser than you know. Stop putting yourself down and connect with the wise goddess, Saraswati. Make a wise choice. Mm. So take the lead. And here we are, taking the lead. Taking the fucking lead. We're taking the lead. Oof. It's so funny because this week on the app, like, our whole lead and our talks have been about vulnerability. And I always say it, right? Vulnerability is a superpower. And vulnerability is the loss of control. Because when you're vulnerable, you can't predict the outcome. Yep. Right. You never know if people are going to receive you good or if people are going to receive you through their own filter of judgment and whatever. And as I was thinking about, you know, over the last few months of us just being super vulnerable about who we are, because we come up here and we say what we've done. We say we've healed and been through these things and kind of surface level, like for us. Right. We say we don't do surface level, but yeah, we have kind of service leveled our own experience because we don't want to be victims. And also, yeah, it's like we don't live there anymore. So I choose not to relive those things. And I, I don't love thinking about them. I don't even love talking about them really. Yeah. But on the other side of who we are is taking the lead Mm -hmm. in this healing process. It's like, we have to take the lead to be vulnerable and be like, yeah, We've gone to these depths, to these darkness, to these places. These things have happened to us. And no matter what has happened to us and no matter what continues to happen to us along the way, we're choosing to see the light in it all. Yeah, We're choosing to take the lead and say, yeah, a lot of people play victim and a lot of people live in this sickness. 
But the truth is, is that when you really deeply understand that everything in this world is happening for you and not to you, you understand that no matter how much pain you're in, no matter how much shitty shit has happened to you along the way, that there is always light. Yeah. There's always light. There's always light. And, and when you have that awareness and you have that deep understanding, the people that reflect you in your life are that. They're going to show you the light. Yeah. They're going to show you the light. Absolutely. So as much as today is going to be, you know, focused on, you know, my story and my path, that I'm really going to try to focus on the light. Mm. And as I start my story and as I start in this place of, vulnerability which I've been in my head about all day of being like (laughs) how can I share this in a way that shows that these things have happened to me but really focus on the healing but also really focus on the pain because our pain is all the same yeah our pain is all being unvalued unseen unheard unlovable unworthy right like no matter what my story is no matter what I identify as whether it's this trauma or this thing and the other part and what I said to Taylor as I got here like my biggest bright light moment has been that as somebody who's dealt with trauma my entire life right and and a lot of people have in in When our brains, it's our brain's job, right, to keep us safe. And I always say, it's like one of my first things that I say, if you come into the studio, I give you essential oil and I say, it's our brain's job to keep us safe. And how it does that is it puts us in the past and it puts us in the future. And so when we're in these moments of vulnerability, we really have to tell our mind that we're safe. And what happens is, is that when we have these traumas growing up, that our brain just focuses on these trauma points and wants to keep us in that place of being like, don't do that again. Don't put yourself in that situation again. These are the bad things that are happening to you. So I'm going to keep you safe. So I'm going to keep you focused on the bad shit. And so I've, spent so much of my life focused on the bad shit that's happened to me that sometimes it's when I sit back and say okay I deeply understand all this bad shit that's happened but in the midst of it all there's been so much beautiful shit yeah right and like that I haven't been focused on of course and so the healing journey is really being like okay I've been so focused on all the bad shit and I want to play the victim and I want to use that and it's good right because I've turned all my pain into power yep and so into purpose uh, yeah pain power purpose right we can all transform that so instead of focusing on all this pain now that I've turned it into this purpose where like I've had this purpose where I have the studio I have the podcast I have revive I have all these beautiful things that I've like my pain has driven me into being such a focused person into helping all the pathways and all the people that I can in every way that I possibly can yeah and both of us have Mm -hmm. Um, now I get to share it in a way of being like, okay, the pain that I'm about to share with you all is only because I want to relate to you. It's only because I want to tell you that I've been where you've been. Yep. And now you can know that you don't have to identify with that. You can identify with this purpose of the reason why that everything that has happened in my life that I'm about to share with you has happened to me because I'm sitting right here right Right now now. yeah (laughs) this moment this moment yeah I believe that to my core same you know in feeling the most seen that I've ever felt the most value that I've ever felt the most love I've ever felt and it's not because it is a reflection where it, where I've like invited these mirrors in of my mm-hmm. life because the deep work that I've done, but it's because for the first time in my life, I see myself deeper than I've ever seen myself. Yeah, I love myself deeper than I've ever loved myself. I hear myself in my inner wisdom more than I've ever heard ever in my life. Yeah, and new there's era. We're in a new era, baby. In the reflection of that, I know is epic is epic i know it's It's the most beautiful thing so here we go 
Yes. Buckle up. <laughs> I'm like, where's I'm, my popcorn? Yeah, it's the, the tea, baby. I got the tea for you. <laughs> but really, I'm going to be sitting here listening with like my hands crossed. Nice. <laughs> but because I just love it so much. I know. Right. It's just it's it. Right. Yeah. So because even um, like after all this time, like I know I'm story, but still it's still relatable. Like that's how we connected. I, mm. I heard her tell her story. And I was like, oh, my fucking God, she gets it. Like, one person that I've met in this little community who, like, oh, my God, she gets it. So, I mean, I've heard it so many times, but it's just It's so going to be different today. I know. It's, but that's – it's always different, you know? You always yeah. tell it a little bit differently. I do. Because it, 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 I just trust, right? I mean, right? yeah, that's It's like I I'm it going to call it in right now. Every, every time before I, you know, teach a live, before I do a card deck, it's – it's all the ancestors, all my guides, all the elements, the earth, the air, the water, the fire, everything that is inside me, around me, all my guides, all my angels, knowing deeply that I'm divinely protected and everything that I have been through and every experience has shaped me into who I am. And I know when I speak that it's because I need to speak because people need to hear what I have to say and that every ounce of pain that I've dealt with in my life and every ounce of inconvenience and whatever it is, has led me to be an example. Yep. And a phoenix. A phoenix. Rising from a the phoenix, ashes. A phoenix, baby. Love that. No matter what. Or the prettiest cockroach you ever did see. <laughs> yeah, but seriously. <laughs> <laughs> She's unkillable. <laughs> Unfuckable. <laughs> this one right here. Yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's it, right? The prettiest cockroach. Okay. So I'm going to say, and I'm going to preface this, which I love my parents deeply and honorably and my mother and my father are the closest people to me in my life in this moment right now in yep. that I deeply have the most compassion and empathy and understanding that every single person in this world is unprepared for motherhood, for fatherhood, and especially like you know, coming from what my parents came from and all of that. And I'm going to share a little bit, but I'm also going to protect my family because mm -hmm. it is so important to me so today important. to just know that these situations weren't anybody's fault and I'm not a victim of yeah. anything. So as I was a child, you know, there was sexual abuse happening to me from the age of five until I was about 11 and my parents were working really hard because that was the programming back then. It was like, work hard, play hard, work your nine to five, pay your bills, do your thing. And then on Friday, you live your yep. life you and party. you party hard and you party hard, all weekend. Work hard, party harder. That's, yeah. that's what it was. Right? Yeah. And like, we can all relate to that. I mean, I was born in 86, so late eight, it's like the 70s babies, right? Like, that's, that's what it was. Like, yeah. we were doing what we were doing to build. And my dad was building a business. And my mom, she's got a great career and she's still worked for the same thing. And, and I just love and I value their work ethic and all that stuff. But things were you know, unnoticed and unwitnessed and lying was my first escape. And when I was in first grade, I'll never forget it. These things were happening to me behind closed doors and I was going into school and I was making up these elaborate lies yeah. that like I was sleeping outside in a tent and my parents, like all of these situations and all of these things. And lying was my first escape from reality. Yep. And I created all these things. And then through that, like my parents didn't realize, right? Because they didn't know because, you know, my dad was raised by nuns and his parents were divorced early and he was on his own at 16. And my mom was also being sexually traumatized at a young age by a family member. So it's like these, these ripple effects, right? And these yeah. are all deep understandings because I've had these uncomfortable conversations asking my mom why. And I knew that these things were happening to my mom and and it was just like these generational curses, right? Mm -hmm. It's like this, there's like sexual trauma. And the more you talk about it and the more open you're about it, the more you realize that this shit happened to everyone. Men, women, kids, uncles, aunts, it cousins. Really like it, I'm, not, I'm not unique in this. I Nobody know. is unique in this. And I it, think once you start to show up and share your story, it's like, wow. Yeah. It was older cousins it, doing it, it. It was siblings yeah. doing it. It was aunts and uncles doing it because 
back in the day, like that was it. Like there was no boundaries. There was no, and nobody cared. And, and it's nobody all, talked, nobody communicated ever. Yeah. There so was no communication. It doesn't matter like who it was, what it was like. And, and then it's like the curiosity of it all because sex is so taboo. So people aren't having these conversations about sex and kids start to, you know, self-stimulate at such a young yeah. age. They're sticking their hands down their pants. Yeah. They're doing all these things and everybody's like, just don't do it. And I mean, kid, little kids get hard-ons and nobody's telling them that what it's happening. It's just it's like, normal. oh. It's normal. It's your body's f- physiological response. Right. So you need to have conversations younger. You yes. need to have conversations about bo- body boundaries and people not touching you at a young age and no matter whether they're your family members or not your family members like it's just different and when we have these awarenesses you're like wait this happened to almost everyone yeah because people weren't talking about the shit so lying was my first escape then because I was lying and because nobody was realizing this underlying issue and I was the youngest of two. I had two older brothers. I was the youngest and I was the only girl and I was my dad's only child. My dad adopted my two brothers. My mom was married before. She was in an abusive relationship. My dad took my two brothers in and then they had me and I was the only girl. And I mean, this may be my own thing, but I really think my dad wanted a boy. So I was raised like a boy. I was like riding four wheelers Mm. and dirt bikes and at the racetrack. And and I have all these beautiful memories, but he was so strict with me. I never went to prom. I never got dressed up. I could never crazy to me. You guys, let's just backtrack. She never went to prom. Well, I did. Okay. I I lie. Okay. So we're going to backtrack. I went my freshman year. My brothers was a senior and my brother's friend, like, broke up with his girlfriend and I like I was a freshman and he was a senior and I went to a prom and I hated everything about it and oh it was just because I went to the party but I got it's like I might I could never go on dates I couldn't talk to boys on the phone like so I just turned into one of the boys and that was like how I lived my life I was yeah. always just like one of the boys so I I was I was a troublemaker I I started you know, I started lying and I started deceiting and I started stealing money from my dad. And, and it was 2011. I was like stealing a bunch of money from my dad for no reason. I feel bad for my dad and I love him <laughs> and he's a saint. And I was just so angry because of all of these things. And then I started selling drugs and it was like this excitement for me. Right. So in seventh grade, I was rolling joints and selling them in my cigarette pack in seventh grade. I'll never forget. My dad came he caught me, he found a stack of money, a thing of scales. He came and he dumped out my locker and he was just like standing there. And I was just like, oh, oh my man. God. And then he tried to get me in trouble. So I was just so angry. Like I was just so angry. So that anger and that resentment and, and all that stuff, I just ran away. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to be there. And then I was so good because I was a liar and I was all of these things that I would go to these people's houses. Like my, my friends, parents would take me in yeah. and I would like give them this sob story about, you know, this and that. And I would create these stories because again, I was a liar. this is back then too, right? Like the, your parents didn't talk to these parents, yeah. right? No. Yeah. There was no communication. No. Like you could tell one parent you were going somewhere <laughs> and then the other one you were going there and then they did, had no fucking clue where you were going. Because they were so busy in their own lives. Yes. In that, and Nobody I don't communicated yeah communication is key right so I had these amazing people that would take me in throughout my teenage years and I would just be you know I worked I went to high school I made high honors because I was a master manipulator I mean I remember one time (laughs) this is so funny I was it was my freshman year it was my first year of high school and I was so drunk. Every day I was drunk in high school. Every day I smoked weed. Like I, I was taking drugs. The first, like, I, I mean, I was doing ecstasy and acid in seventh yep. and eighth grade. Like, it just didn't, like, I, like to think about doing that now. But I was like, Wild. my, uh, my, I'll never forget it, Mr. Lodico. I was like, I, my dad still has had a relationship with my guidance counselor, still recently, like, sold him cars. But... I was so drunk in school and I like had to hold on to desks to like get to 
to like the outside where I was like getting called for detention and my assistant principal <laughs> came out and he like gave me detention. I went and served detention. He came back to the same class the next day and he was like, Miss Cloutier, if I ever see you in that state again in school, like I will have to do something about it. And like, my just God. like let me go about my day because I was just like hustling. He knew I was working two jobs. I was working at Walgreens. I was playing field hockey. I was just doing all of these things, but like not understanding yeah. how I was capable of doing these things. But so along the way of like doing it all, I just like stayed attached to this like sick, fast lifestyle. And I just removed myself from my parents and I love them. And, and that's what I want to say is because the more that I focused on in my healing journey, like all the trauma along the way of like my dad being strict or whatever was happening with like the family member or whatever it was, right? Like I was so hyper focused on the trauma that in the reality of it, now that I look back, there was so many beautiful memories. Mm -hmm. There were so many beautiful memories of being at camping or like doing this or yeah. doing that. And like, I really had like a great life. All my best memories are outside memories. All like of at them. at camp or in nature. Yeah. Walk in the woods with my best friend. Martha's Vineyard or yeah. just like doing things in New England, right? And But I want to stay focused on the trauma because my brain keeps me there. Yeah. And of it's course. like a sick... I don't know if it, it's like a sickness. I don't want to call it that. But it's like sometimes... When we're so identified by our stories. Yeah. Right? Or these well, that's things. Well, that is who you, it is your identity. So it's like when you start to do the work and you start to let go of these things and heal through some things, it's like you're almost refinding yourself because you're like, that was my identity for so long. The yeah. broken, sad little girl who was molested, but now I'm here. Yeah. It's like, Wait, yeah, it's very disorienting sometimes. And like, you're just like, who and the timelines are disorienting, yes. and like, you, what you focus on is disorienting. And it's like, oh, it's like there was so much pain. And, and it's you like, were such a, like, we were such pathological liars. It's like, what part of my story is real and what part yeah. is like made up in my own fucking head because I don't know. Like, yeah. I mean, there's things that you know for sure that happen, but then there's also little details where you're like, did that happen or was that a nightmare or like, did that happen or like, was I not really awake or conscious for it? Like just little things that you're like, don't really know, but like, you know, stuff like that. And it's like, why do you have to be focused on that? Why can't you just be focused on the beautiful part? But, but that's what I'm saying right now is like, as you heal deeper, you're able to shift the perspective. You'll be able to shift to be like, wait, this, my whole life I've identified as this like traumatized person, this yep. like sick person, this, you know, incest, like whatever yep. shame, guilt, you know, instead of looking at it with compassion and empathy and, and all these beautiful things. So my first car accident was when I was 16. I was <laughs> my so funny because I was just I sometimes I just like really recently talk about these stories and I'm like oh my god so like, yeah so bad so bad so I was bad. 16 hanging out at bike week my first car accident ever it was like my first my first time I did heroin like actual heroin I was 16 years old and I was doing 80s already and we were we couldn't get 80s but this guy was like oh we can get these tickets and it was like do you remember those little, little packets tickets. from Lawrence tick, where tick, it was tick, like tick. little tickets like imprinted yeah and it was like oh yeah it's tickets it's like ground up 80s that's what like the guy said he's like yeah we're just like grinding it up to sell it cheaper and I'll never forget it so I went to bike week I went to bike week all week and it fell on Father's Day and I hadn't talked to my dad and I was living with my friend Danielle and Drew and Bedford and I was still going to school and I had a little Dodge Neon that my dad actually got because he always wanted to help his intentions were always good but it was almost like he didn't know how you know because yeah. I was just like so chaotic and crazy and it was just it's, it was a reflection of me and so I was like I want to go see my dad on Father's Day so I left bike week I drove home I remember I was so tired and I stopped at a gas station and I went to, I, 
I was like, I'm going to make it. I was like 20 minutes away. And I fell asleep at the wheel. I crashed into a telephone pole. The telephone pole came crashing down on my car. I had a whole glove box full of drugs. And I remember getting out of the car, throwing the the drugs in the woods, and, like, getting out. And I got electrocuted because I stepped on the wire. And my dad came to the hospital, and he was like, she's on drugs, this, like, whole thing. And (laughs) I went to the hospital, and I was totally fine. And the next – I got let out of the hospital. I went and got the drugs out of the woods and just, like, kept it moving. It was just, like, always these situations. After that, it was I got it, it was I got into a motorcycle accident because I was like driving like you know double stand up wheelies like all these like mm-hmm. crazy things. I got dumped off the back of a motorcycle. I fell off, cracked my tailbone in two places. I, I just like terrible. It, and then 2019 was a real pivotal point for me. It was not only and it's hard too because I I feel like as I talk about it, it's like timelines are like really hard too because I did yeah. so many drugs yeah. that it's like when did this happen I was actually how old to, was I was I 18 yeah, or was I <laughs> or 12 what was I doing where was I at these were just like all very pivotal moments but I was 19 because it was 2005 it was 5 505 it was Cinco de Mayo and I got into Cinco. a car I got into a car accident I was working at a bar because I I was working I've always bartended I've always um you know, I started working at the Dairyfield Country Club in Manchester, waitressing. That was always my thing, right? I'm such a people person. Yeah. But in 2005, after the, I can't remember if the motorcycle accident was before or whatever, but it was all very like within a few months. Mm. But I rolled a van on the highway and I was med flighted to Mass General and they couldn't find me in the car for 45 minutes. And I was in a medically induced coma. I have a 13 staples in the back of my head. Um, My shoulder is frozen. They told my parents that I wouldn't remember how to walk, talk, all these crazy things. And at that time at 19, I had been partying and selling drugs and doing all these things. And I had my own apartment and it was just very chaotic. And I'll never forget it because when I woke up from that accident, I was like still... Like, my parents took me back in for the first time, but I got $20,000, and they prescribed me oxys. And they said to Mm. my parents that this was a miracle drug, and that, like, all this Yeah, what year was this? This was, like... 2005. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I had already, like, been dabbling with them, and, like, it was, like, on 2005, think about that. I was in fifth grade in 2005. (laughs) Not even fifth grade, because Cinco de Mayo was the beginning of 2005, which means I was at the end of fourth grade wild y'all oh. yeah so wild so at this point like I had like I had done them a few times like I said like I was 16 like I was doing heroin like these things and then the 80s came about and I got prescribed oxy20s and this car accident wasn't my fault I was working for a bar I was cleaning it in the morning I drove and I crashed it my friend was behind me it took him 45 minutes to get me out of the car they couldn't find so me scary. it was so scary um and then I was fine like yep. after the accident, like I was walking, I was talking, I was fine. I remember being so angry at my parents because they tried to like control my <laughs> beds. And I was like, give me my fucking meds. I'm fucking out of here. I'm going back to my friend's house. All my people were around me. And then right after that is when I met Taylin. And she was on one of our podcasts. Like one of our very first, y'all. One like of our, episode two or something. Yeah. Maybe even three. Two and I three. was bartending and I was stripping. So... <laughs> back to that the day I turned 18 I walked into the strip club at Mark Show Place and in Bedford New Hampshire and the day I turned 18 I became a stripper because for me like sexual power and sexual energy like I had lost power control to men for so long I was just gonna say I think that obviously stems from sexual trauma as a child yeah like finally like yep. taking your power back right yep. and I just like felt and I was making a shit ton of money and I was selling drugs to all the strippers so I was not only making like money there doing that and then like that lifestyle right yep. it's just Chaos. like I always like dated older men and did all the things it's just like some of that's like important but it's really not right it's all like the same feelings of being like oh yeah so me and Tay Lynn, we were selling drugs. I was like running a very fast lifestyle, getting jumped, doing all of these things. Like it was just so 
chaotic. And then me and Tiglin got an apartment. We were like really selling a lot of drugs together. I was bartending, doing all these things. And then she got arrested. She was the driver in a drive-by shooting. I was supposed to be there that night. I was dope sick. Like sometimes these things, when I look back, it's like knowing that you're so divinely protected and like not Mm. being in these very integral pieces and parts, like looking back, it's almost like a chess game. And then after that, after Taylin, you know, she was out on bail for a long time. and We were just still like doing just like all the behaviors. It's it's just like these, you know, chaos. Yeah, the shit. It's like you're just so comfortable in chaos. Yep. And then she went away to jail and then I had nobody because like her mom was my mom and we were just like all living together. And then I was living in a hotel in Portland, Maine. And I was stripping at a club, Platinum Plus, up there in, in Maine. And then I met a guy. <laughs> and he, how it always happens. <laughs> I met a guy met at the guy strip club. At the strip. Well, I was he a fell stripper. In love with the stripper. <laughs> I was, you know, you know, stripping, and I was making a lot of money, and I was stripping, and 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 he was from California, and he couldn't sell any of the drugs to the strip clubs, but to the strippers, and he was like, "Why can't I sell?" And, and then there was me, and I was selling all the drugs to the strippers. So and like in me, this bitch. time, in this time is when I actually met the father of my first child. And we'll get back to the point of that. But he actually robbed me. He was living in a sober house and he robbed me of 2080s, which was like a couple thousand dollars. And we'll get back to that story. But that was in Maine in 2005 is when Wild. I met Gavin said right before I met my um, this man that I married in Vegas <laughs> so I meet him and he's like oh yeah I can get these things for like a quarter of the price that I was getting them and at this point I was living in Maine but I was driving down to Manchester to like get them cheaper to drive back up to Maine which was super risky and everybody was watching me and I would take my friends other cards and like do this whole thing so I met him and he was like I'm from California and I have a house in Miami and I'm like you're the one I want to marry. So let's go. Yeah. <laughs> so we met on, it was like 7, 7, 0, 7 was like the day that we met. And then we got married on 7, 14, 0, 7. It was like something crazy like that. And so we went to Vegas and I remember I called my mom. I'm like, mom, I'm going to Vegas. She's like, just don't get married. Oh my God. <laughs> I'll never she forget would. it. My mom. Yeah, she knew. So I go to Vegas and I have these pictures and they're so you guys funny. I might throw them up in this post like <laughs> just because you have to fucking see them. It's like a straight up fucking Pamela Anderson type fucking shit. We got married in the little white chapel like where Britney Spears like got dead. married. Like seriously. Like, like these like, pictures are fire. <laughs> in Jordan sneakers. Like if anybody knows me, like, and, like you know I get this. And like pre-tattoo. Like pre-tattoo. Yeah, I have no tattoos. No fucking tats. It's wild. <laughs> it's fucking wild. The sunglasses kill me. Versace sun- sunglasses, like bangs, like long dark hair. My hair is normal. Like it's it's very strange. So anyway, so I meet this guy and his last name is Mountain. And I called my mountain. mom. I called my mom and I'm like, I'm not a clue here anymore. I'm a mountain. And my mom is like, Amy, whatever kind of drugs you're on, you just need to hang up the phone and go to sleep. <laughs> night, night. Go to bed. I'm like, you know, I'm a mountain. I'm married. <laughs> my God. Oh my God, my poor mom. Love you, mom. It's fine. So anyways, so we get married and then we go down to Miami and my whole and I'm and it was right before I turned 21. And as I turned 21, I live in South Beach, Miami. And so my whole 21st year, I live in South Beach, Miami for this guy that I had just met. He had this like million dollar home. We were paying our landlord thirteen thousand dollars in cash every single month. Like that's how much our rent was. Thirteen thousand dollars. We had this like shoe company. We were selling all kinds of drugs, interstate trafficking, like from California to Maine. And thank God it's like past like the yep. <laughs> the time of whatever. Like this was 2007, so you can't yeah. come and get me now. Like yeah. But I did some like really like fucked up shit through the mail. All it, it uh, and like I should be in federal prison. This is like the divinely protected shit. Yeah. Like. I used to drive a Cadillac DeVille on 22s. Like, I crashed it doing nitrous at the wheel. 
sometimes I'm like, wait a second. And sometimes I'll like text these people because I still talk to Tyler. Um, he, we're going to wait. So through, I lived in Miami for the first year. The first three months that I was living in Miami, I was the worst that I had ever been drug wise. I was working at a bar down there. It was called Automatic Slims. It was right on Ocean Boulevard. I, it was like a coyote ugly bar. We were like dancing on the bars and the rule was like you couldn't not drink. And there was just like piles of cocaine on the back of the bar. Like yeah. just wild shit. It was like, a different time back then. Different time. I would get out of the bar at four o'clock in the morning and I would go and sleep on the beach and I would like drive home. Like it was just like it was just a very different, different time. And even when I think about that now, I'm just like, how did I survive? Like through yeah. everything, through all the chaos and like what it was. So we were doing that. We were living. And every day it was like, are the feds going to come and pick me up? And there was like a bunch of other like crazy chaotic things that like I don't need to get into the details of it all. But it was it was crazy and it was chaotic. And there was all these other like wild experiences happening, but I lived in a year. Um, it was my first experience. I remember I did it. I, I, the first time I came out with my sexual trauma and my sexual abuse, I was in so much pain down there and it didn't matter what I had. I was living in this beautiful home. I had like the cars and the driveway and all of these things. And I was so miserable because I was carrying this deep, dark secret of the trauma that had happened to me as a child. And like, it didn't matter the amount of drugs I was consuming, nothing took the pain away. And I'll never forget it. I wrote a suicide note and I took a bunch of drugs and I, it was the first time. And I remember Tyler read the note and he called my parents and like said everything that was happening. And I got picked up and I had to get my stomach pumped and I had to spend the week in a mental institution. And I woke up from that drug overdose and they told me that I was pregnant and I was 21 and I was like, I absolutely cannot have a baby right now. So at that time, I, even though I was married and, you know, had all these outside things, I was like, I absolutely cannot be a mom. So I had my, um, my one and only abortion, right? So it's like all these things that I could carry shame and mm -hmm. guilt about as a woman, like being a stripper as a start to having sexual trauma and now having an abortion and now being married. Like, the, you know, it's just like all of these shameful things. It's like, it doesn't matter because yeah, there's freedom in it. There's freedom in, in healing. So I had an abortion. I spent seven days in a mental institution. I came out and, and um, our dealer in California had got popped and it was like all everything like happened like divinely. And we were so afraid and it doesn't really make sense why we did this, but we packed up all our shit from Miami and we drove con cross country and went to California. And I don't really understand why the person got caught in California and we were like, let's, let's go to go California. There. But that's what happened because his family was California and his mom was going to let us stay there. So we went to California. We drove cross country. It was like the shittiest thing. We were doing drugs. All I don't even remember it. I know we stopped in New Orleans. I know we stopped in Texas, but I don't really remember. But we drove from Miami all the way across country with a U-Haul full of shit just overnight. Just like yeah. went. And I lived in California for three years and we kind of like got it together and I like got sober a little bit and I was like just like taking prescription painkillers because of my accident. I was able to go to the hospital. I got a good job at this restaurant in Brigantine and we got a house and we were growing weed legally and we were doing all these things and, and we did that for a couple years. And surprisingly enough, that marriage that I met for this guy, like we lived I was together say, for you knew three him years. For fucking seven days, married him and then we're together for like a long time. Yeah. And, and I can't really know because we had a house and we were growing weed and we were doing everything legally in California and I was working at this restaurant. And then, you know, sometimes people are addicted to just the lifestyle. Sometimes people aren't addicted to drugs, but they're addicted to the fast money. Yeah. They're addicted to this that quick lifestyle, right? And, and it's easy money. And that's where he was. And um, he got a call and it was from our friend in Maine that we were like selling all the drugs with. And he was like, oh, I need a bunch of those. And I was like, it's a setup. My intuition has always been what it is and I was like it's a setup Tyler don't go like we can't do this and he was like I'm going I need to make money I want to set us up just all of a sudden I looked at him and I said listen I'm 23 years old at this time and I said if you go and you end up in federal prison like I, I'm not gonna stay with yeah, you yeah I'm not waiting I'm not waiting and he was like I'm gonna be fine I'm gonna be fine and uh 24 hours later he called me from jail and uh now I was in California alone I had no friends no no nobody and uh 
I got right back into drugs. I had some like people that I knew at the restaurant and I got right back in and I went to Ocean Beach and there was this girl, Shannon, and oh God, she loved me so much and she would let Shan? me sit. You're talking about Shan my Shan? No, Shannon. It's oh. this girl in California. And um I was like, Oh my god, Shan. We still talk to her a little bit, but um, I still like connect with her a little bit, but no, she would let me stay on her couch. And then I bartended and I was like living on the beach homeless. And I was like, you know, you know, meeting people and like doing these things. And it's really easy to be like homeless in California, but yeah. for only so long, yeah. for only so long. So it lasted about eight months to a year. And then my brother got married <laughs> and my brother's wife, she's a saint. My brother, Jimmy, he's a saint. He's always been so there for me. And they were like, we really want you to be here in the wedding. And I'm like, mm really don't want me to be in your wedding I promise you I was like 90 pounds my hair is up to here I was like you really don't want me and they're like come back come home I'm like well my ex my husband just like went to federal prison it's really not great and so I came back and I caused a bunch of chaos in my family like big surprise fucked everything up and then they were on buddy passes because my and I like flew to New York and they just dis I disappeared for like a week and nobody knew where I was and they were on their honeymoon and I really just like fucked a bunch of shit up with my family and then I tried to go back to California and I lasted a couple more months and then I came back home and uh, nobody wanted anything to do with me because I had caused all this chaos right mm -hmm. this whole time so I came back to New Hampshire and I was with Taylan's mom for a little bit and it was just like still like chaos and I was trying to like make money and like do all these things with all these people but I haven't been around in four years because I was in Miami and I was in California and it was just, and it, I was the darkest moments of my life where I was, I call it purgatory, right? Where I wanted to die every single day and I was trying to bartend and I was trying yeah. to strip and I was, it was just so toxic and it was like so painful and I'll never forget it. I'll never forget this purgatory time where I slept on park benches. I slept underneath the bridge. Like I, I literally, like it wasn't long, it wasn't long stints of that. And like, I could always like manipulate somebody cause that's like who I was. I didn't have this like, crazy but there was definitely moments of just like deep like just I call it portrait I literally would be so angry when I opened my eyes in the morning mm -hmm. so angry I can relate and so I'll never forget it I was in a trap house my dad would like let me come and like clean cars or like do something and give me a little bit of money and like people would like try to like help me in the best way that they could but my parents say that they were just like had to just write me off as dead mm -hmm. you know they had to like grieve me and say if she makes it she makes it if not like we've already grieved her as she was alive and um I'll never forget it it was my my brother's baby's mom Katie and and I was sleeping on her couch and I woke up and I said this can't be my life anymore <laughs> I don't know why it's for the first time in my life that I thought for a second that this can't be my life anymore. And I left the trap house. There was like a baby and I had like a bottle of Hennessy and I was like shooting it. It's just so dark, like mm. so dark. And um, I walked to her house because I didn't have my license. I lost my license for five years. I had no license. I had no car. I literally had nothing. Like I had literally nothing. And... Um, I went to this detox in Manchester called Serenity. I remember being in the phone box. I had no insurance. I had no money. I had no nothing. And um, I went to detox, and it was this place called Serenity in Manchester. It was like, God, what is that? It was like off of Elm Street. And uh, it was a non-medical detox, so I got nothing. And I was coming off of alcohol. I was coming off of heroin. I was coming off of benzos. I was coming off of cocaine. I was coming off of crystal meth. I was just a dumpster anything that made me feel better just anything and um my kidneys were failing my liver was failing I, my ankles were like so swollen my eyes were yellow I was 25 years old and I was dying from the inside Crazy. out I was having seizures coming off of the benzos they I, yeah. I was like in and out of the hospital it was so bad and then I detoxed for almost 18 days I was like that it was just water and Tylenol it was no methadone, Ugh. no suboxone, no. It was like what? It was like comfort. It was like it. comfort meds. What did they? Was it like yeah, comfort meds? Comfort meds. Comfort meds. That's what they call them when they when but, you don't get shit in the fucking <laughs> rehab. It's called comfort meds. It's they give you ibuprofen and tell you to go to bed. I'm like, bitch, what? Yeah, maybe like Seroquel to sleep or something like no, that. That's I didn't how even it was. Get the fucking Seroquel. That's how it was back in the day. 
And and then they were trying to give you like Lexapro and like all these things. But yeah, I was they like, immediately. Wait. Let's just take note on that. They immediately, like immediately want to put you on Anx- some type of mood stabilizer, an antidepressant and a fucking anti-anxiety med. Immediately, I mean, right yeah. out of the gate, day one of fucking treatment, they're already talking about what meds you need to leave on or suboxone or methadone. You need to do an MAT program because you're not going to leave here and have success. You're going to go out and you're going to relapse. So then the whole time you're in there, you, you're you like, oh, I'm fuck. Fucked. I'm fucked. And that's what I'm going to say. Of course you're fucking depressed. You just fucking ran your life into the ground. Drugs. Of course you have anxiety. You have no idea how to deal with your emotions. You've just been drugging yourself up for your entire life. Like, it's insane. So... And Again, I was just like, outdated. no, outdated I was just like, system. no, I'm not going to be comfortable. The fact that I just came off of coming off of all these pills to like go on these other pills. Like I'm just going to relapse. So I left. It was like the, it was like the first day I felt good. I called some people and I was like, I'm good. I'm not an addict. I don't, I'm going to smoke weed and just drink alcohol. I can just not shoot dope. And then uh, within like 24 hours I was shooting heroin and I had a bed at mm-hmm. Farnham and um, they still let me come back in. And I went to Farnham, and um, it was when it was on the old Hanover Street. <laughs> that 24-hour cycle. It was the old Hanover Street, and I was, like, very unwell. And um, I was going to meetings, and then, like, I met a guy. And it was that guy that I said that robbed me back in the day. He came up to me and said a thing and did a thing. And he was a few years sober, and I wasn't sober. And I was like, oh, you're paying attention to me. This is great. Yeah. And... Um, and then one thing led to another and I ended up pregnant and I was a few months sober and I was not in a place that I should have been pregnant because I had no business. I had no idea how to regulate my emotions. I've been traumatized since I was four years old. I've literally been in these situations to where I've like I've escaped and in all of that. Right. And and along the way, things happened and um, I'm going to protect myself here and not really go too deep into that and I'm going to protect my child and not go deep into that but um eventually as you know I I was a couple months pregnant and that relationship didn't work out so I ended up in a situation where I was homeless again no job no license no car and um I had to work to like put myself up and I've always been driven and passionate and I know how to work and I know how to make money and I know how to take care of myself that's something that nobody will ever take away from me and I got about seven months pregnant and um and and that just like wasn't the reality and and then things happened and um eventually I had to go back to rehab and um and I had to completely recreate and and rechange my life. And my son was three months old and I got sober and, you know, I haven't touched a hard drug or felt that way about myself since that day on August 5th, 2011, the day that I finally, you know, realized who I was and what I was worth. Yeah. And my son was born on June 7th, 2011, and it took a few months of pain and turmoil and chaos and, and all of these things and, and, and really feeling like, and I say it, right, like my whole life I never had anything to work and drive for because my internal condition was always deep-rooted pain and trauma and, yep. and because I focused on that and because yep. I didn't know how to get out of that process. Yeah. So then once I had something to fight for, a.k.a. Gavin, my child who saved my life, um, my whole world changed. Yeah. <laughs> the light came. He was my light. He was my savior. I saw him. And finally, for the first time in my life, I said, I'm a mom. <laughs> it's beautiful. I for the first time in my life, it's not about me. It's about him. And sometimes that's that's enough for people and sometimes that's not. And that's okay too, right? Because it wasn't in the beginning for me. It yeah. took me a couple months to get Which, there. that's another thing. Like they tell you that you can't get sober, you can't get cleaner for, for anyone else. But that wasn't my experience. I got clean for someone else and I stayed clean. Yeah. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Like that's the point. Like everyone's journey is different. Everyone's story is different. You do whatever it takes to stay in in a position where you're safe and where you're sober and where you're your best self. Yeah, whatever it takes. 
Yeah. So Gavin was born and I just made the decision, right? Like I made the decision to like fight. I went to the Phoenix house in Keene. Oh, it was August. I went to Phoenix house in Keene. Oh my God, I couldn't even smoke cigarettes. Fucking they terrible a, there. We had to like make our own food. I have trauma from that place, legit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the treatment back there was not like I work in treatment centers now and I'm like, wow, this was not my experience in treatment yeah. ever. But it, it made me who I am and I'm super grateful. And I honestly think think a lot of people should have treatment the, the way that we experience treatment because maybe, we, you know. Yeah, I don't know. They were tough. But like at the end of the day, I think, yeah, that's where I learned about myself and my condition and who I was, and holy fuck, this is like got to be the turning point because now yeah. I have this knowledge. How can I go out and still do the same shit with this knowledge? Like, I mean, you can, but I feel like each time you come back a little bit sooner because you have all this knowledge now about who you are and why you do the things you do. And oh my God, like, it finally makes sense. Yeah. It all makes sense. It all makes sense eventually, right? Yeah. And so I went to the Phoenix house in Keene. I was there for two months. I did two 30-day back-to-back treatments. And it was the worst because I had nowhere to go. I was homeless. I didn't have custody of my son. I had child neglect charges. It was it was tough. And um, I had nothing and I had nobody. And my parents were again because I had, like, built this, you know, relationship back up with them. And they didn't know that, you know, I was doing the things that I was doing. And so... I had to rebuild all of that. So I went to treatment. I was there for two months. And then I went to this place out in Minnesota called The Retreat. And it literally saved my life. And it was ran by a bunch of 12-step volunteers. And I'll never forget it. It was like just so beautiful. And it was in October. And the leaves were changing. And a Mumford and Sons Awake, my soul, if you guys know the song, yeah, um, so good. I remember I had like a little iPad shuffle. So if anybody's as old as I am, <laughs> little iPad. Sh- oh my god! It was like shuffles. this, and I had like fifty songs on it that my mom had put on it. So it was like all these like weird ass <laughs> songs. But the Mumford and Sons album was on there, and I'd be out in the woods just like listening and just like writing and journaling and and just creating this new life for myself. And uh, I came back, and I started to be a mom. And, um, you know, things were happening and there was like just more trauma and situations. And finally, when Gavin is one is when the real like catalyst of change happened for me. And I got my own apartment and I got custody of Gavin back and I was really diving deep into the 12 step program. And that's where I met Kaylin. And I'll never forget it. One of the most profound moments is the situation with Kaylin. And and for those of you who have listened to her story, I was nine months sober and she wasn't sober and I was helping her and her daughter passed away and I was showing up at the hospital. And I'll never forget calling my sponsor and being like, I can't do this. And she's like, yeah, Amy, you're right. You can't. She's like, but God can. And all you Mm. have to do is show up and you don't have to say anything and you don't have to do anything. All you have have to to do is be a presence. And I think hearing that message and knowing that has really been the catalyst of everything that I've done along this past 10 years is to know that I am not responsible for anything. I'm not responsible for the good and I'm not responsible for the bad. All I can do is show up and listen and hold space and not judge and not try to change and not try to dictate or control anything Mm -hmm. other than my own inner condition and I just get to be a presence and I get to just say I got you and I hear you and I'm here and when I had that shift in consciousness and fuck these past 10 years has been wild and I've really like from that moment on I tried to do my best at that and I've caused didn't to fuck it's like there's just so much, right? It's almost like it should be like part one and part two of Amy's story. Mm. But so, um, we've Kay- got time. Kaylin, um, time. yeah, yeah, yeah. So Kaylin, I was living on my own. That situation with Kaylin happened. I was a year sober. I finally got my license back. I mean, I was a year sober. I was pregnant. I had a baby. I didn't have a car. I was walking to the grocery store. I remember having to call people and humble myself. I was bartending. I 
that there was the only thing I ever did. So nine months sober, I was bartending at the biggest club in New Hampshire. Mm. Um, I decided to go back to hair school. It was so funny. I shared it today as my nine years. I graduated nine years ago from hair school, passed both my cosmetology tests, and never went to hair school. I mean, no, never worked in a salon. Yeah. Graduated. Never I was, made I was, it to the salon. Well, I did. So I was actually apprenticing in Boston for color specialist because I was really good at, like, the fantasy colors and stuff. Um, I was working on Newberry Street in the last few months of hair school and I was going to work down in Boston and then eventually, you know, my career shift changed and I went to work in treatment and the last couple of years of bartending, I was working with Rise Above and I met these guys at an NA convention and they were like, we have a house in New Hampshire and we really want to you know, move our way up to New Hampshire. And I was like, yeah, I had all these um, relationships with treatment centers in New Hampshire because I wanted to give back to state-funded treatment because I got state-funded treatment because I didn't have insurance. So I had with Cynthia Day, with um, the Phoenix House in Keene, with the Farnham Center in New Hampshire, I had all these steady commitments and I had all my sponsees. This was the Wolf Pack time, mm-hmm. right? We all, if, if you know, like we know about the Wolf Pack where I got, I had like, I was just in it, right? Just like seeking relief. And I had all these people and I was just building a community. Yeah. We right? had a huge sponsor fam. Like you just like we I had a huge sponsorship family. As I look back and reflect to all of this, this is I'm a creator of that. I'm yeah. a creator of deep community. And I didn't realize like back then, like what I was creating in having that wolf pack i know was yeah this i know on some kind of smaller level Mm -hmm. right so yeah what i created in like the wolf pack back then was just that like community i had the sponsee i had the sponsee dinners like all of that stuff so yeah it was like tradition we would have dinner every week before the wednesday night (laughs) big book meeting yeah um every week not every night so yeah, I was just like a single mom, like living on the west side. Like I I would always take people in. Like I would always have people sleeping on my couches. Like I was always just like, you know, here for what happened to me, right? Like people taking me in, people doing the things. I was building relationships back with my parents, mm. building relationships back with people. I went to school. I went to hair school. I was trying to just like figure myself out. And I knew that I was destined for more, right? We're always, you know, just knew that we were destined for more. And so I got really involved in the 12-step program. I got really deeply into that, definitely saved my life, but also made me really sick, you know? And I was just overextending myself and um, created the Wolf Pack and then created, you know, was working at Rise Above and then built myself up to create the IOP and the process. And, you know, I was like the director and all of that stuff. And then I met Alex and... Gavin was three at the time and I met Alex and, you know, I, I, I had like a different version of like what I needed in the moment. Right. And so safety and security and all of that, like it was just so much change. Right. And so much just thriving and wanting stability and structure so bad. And so as I like developed this, like identity around 12 step and identity around time right Mm. like the more time I got the more but the truth is is that as I was doing this work and as I was like surface level like doing 12 step work and checking my character defects and doing those kinds of things I wasn't actually dealing with the underlying issue of like it was always about everybody else yeah it was never about seeing myself or hearing myself or valuing myself, right? I needed everybody else to validate me. I needed everybody else to pat me on the back. I needed everybody else to see me. I needed everybody else, you know, it's like all the tattoos and the looks and the everything else. It was always about everybody else, like seeing who I was. And it was never introspective right it was never about me growing deeply to see you know everything that I've been through and everything that I've seen and heard and and all of these things and 
and then I had another baby and, and, you know, I had Xavier and, and then I, I ended up leaving the process and I took my first yoga training and I started diving deep, deep into the spiritual practices of it all. And I took my first yoga teacher training and then I started teaching, you know, sound and yoga in treatment centers and realizing the deep seated that it had nothing to do with addiction. It had nothing to do with the substances, right? We're so confused to think that it's the substances when really it's just the trauma we're continuing to escape you know, our reality, right? And we're continuing to not see that it's a self-love and self-worth journey. And I started my mm -hmm. five years sober, right? They say, oh, you either get your marbles back or you lose them. It's the truth, right? Because when you just surface level shit for so long, yeah, you hit five years and you're like, well, I'm going to fucking kill myself yeah, or I'm going to change. It? Like it's like, or, is um, this it? Yeah. Is this as good as it gets? Yeah. To go to fucking meetings and live in a basement and try to just... Because it fucking sucks. It's miserable. It's fucking miserable. Like, that's what nobody talks about. It's like, yeah, there's moments that fill your cup and there's beautiful moments of, like, you know, stories of seeing people come in and change their lives. And it, it really is. It's, it's beautiful. It's inspiring. It's impactful. It's all of the things. But it fucking sucks. Like, when you hit a certain amount of time and have to keep showing up and have to having to keep doing all of these things, like and not getting to the underlying issue, it's like I'm putting a fucking Band-Aid mm -hmm. on what actually is the problem. And I will say, if like free of judgment, right? Because I do know some people that spend 30 years in AA and they're so happy yeah, and they're so content with just going to meetings and doing that thing. That's amazing. But if you're sitting there and you're fucking white knuckling it through life and you're like, is this it? And I'm suicidal. And I have talked to so many people in a 12 step program that get stuck in that loop that they're like, I'm fucking suicidal. Like, I can't just go mm -hmm. to church basements and spend thinking that I need to do these things and every single forever. day. And I'm sick Every forever. time you show up, you introduce yourself as sick. Like, it's not it. It's not it. It's not it. And, and that was my experience. So I started doing EMDR. I started really working on the trauma. I started, you know, diving deep into spirituality. I went to yoga teacher trainings. I went to Y12SR. Then I did booty. And then I was just like meeting all these people and all these beautiful connections were happening. And, and, um, and then I got married. Um, you know, I got married in Greece and it was so beautiful. But also like... The, the idea of it was all so beautiful and the look of it was all so mm. beautiful but there were so many toxic things that were happening behind the scenes and 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 the feelings and 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 that was a reflection of me it was a reflection of the things that I had left unhealed and I had continued to it's a mirror right like your outer reality is a reflection of your inner chaos Right. Where you're just like, I'm just trying to fix everyone that I'm around. I'm trying to create this. And like you see all this toxic shit and you're like comfortable in that chaos. And you're just like wanting to change people or you f fall in love with the potential of people mm -hmm. and you want to change people. And you're like, I see this. So let's like build you up and do this. And, you know, that's not it. Like you you can't ever change people and you can't ever, you know, do the things and and. I just, I'm so grateful for every experience that shaped me into who I am mm -hmm. in these past couple of years, or these past decades, this past 10 years has really, truly shaped me into who I am. And um, I'll never talk bad about um, the people that I have children with because the truth of the matter is, is that my children are half them. And I deeply love and, you know, that's it. Like everyone's lesson is exactly the lesson. And these past years, this past year of me removing myself from those situations and removing myself from what I thought was going to be my life forever, mm. you know, um, has really shown me my deep inner wounds and shown me, you know, what I never want to be again. And who I don't want to surround myself with again. People that I had that were friends of mine for 10 years. People that I had that I made 
um, of friends during that time in my life when I was a completely different person, when I valued different things, when I saw things differently, when I thought one thing was was it, right? Because I never had that one thing. Yep. And um, it's hard, right? Because <laughs> this is like this is, these are the moments, right? When like, it's like, ooh, you could really like you know, say what you want to say and, and instead you choose the higher road. Yep. Instead you choose the path of saying hurt people hurt people, but healed people heal people. And I can see it all. And I believe that all of my children were created out of love and that every single person that I've met along the way has shaped me into who I am. And that Minus the details and minus the situations, at the end of it, I'm so grateful for every person that I've met, every person that has touched my life, every person that I've spent years in moments of vulnerability with and moments of people actually seeing who I am. Yeah. That the truth of it all is, is that it's led me right here and that there has been so much pain and there has been so many moments where I really thought it was easier to give it up. And I've talked about that in the podcast a lot. But at the end of the day, the details don't matter. At the end of the day, what matters is that we're all going through the feelings. shit. Yep. The feelings and matter. that the path is challenging. Yep. Like Challenges aren't a part of the path. Challenges are the path. Yeah. And that we choose every single thing that we choose. And we choose every single person that we choose along the way. And every single thing that I've chosen has been chosen because of a reflection of my inner reality. So in those moments when my reflection was the people around me was toxic and chaos and um, thinking that money and power and all of that is like the arrival moment, right? Mm -hmm. Because I was so caught up in that lifestyle and thinking that that was it. And then when you remove yourself and realize that it's so deeply more about the inner condition of being empathetic and compassionate and understanding and deeply loving that none of that outside shit actually matters. That it yep. doesn't matter what you're wearing. It doesn't matter what you're driving. It doesn't matter any of that, right? It matters about how you lay your head down at the pillow at night and how you treat people yep. and how you treat people. And it's really unfortunate that I was treated so poorly by so many people. And at the end of the day, I know that my heart is pure. And I know that my intentions are pure in that in the bigger picture of it all, that that truth will shine. Yeah. And it's continued to shine. <laughs> and Karma, and, baby. That's all I got to say. And that... Been praying for karma for too long now. <laughs> yeah. And so through, you know, through my marriage and through nine years of a relationship and through the biggest lessons and, and all of it has led me here. And, and I think that that's why we want to be be vulnerable. I think that that's why we want to be so open about who we are. And we really want to say like, we're not just somebody that's like, oh, this is like cliche, right? Like this is like it, like this is the it moment, right? Because spirituality is so hype and we just want to be like hype girls or like we want all the likes or all the shit. Like I don't fucking give a shit about it. I give a shit about the fact that I show up in places and I share what I share about who I am and I share what I share that I was homeless and hopeless and I've lived in purgatory and I've wanted to die. And no matter how far down I have gone and how much shame and guilt I hold from mm -hmm. my past experiences and things that have happened to me that were out of my control and that I'm not a reflection of how people, other people treated me, that that's a reflection of them, that no matter what that I've you know, sold my soul to the devil so many times, yeah. right? That it doesn't fucking matter that today I am the woman that I am and I choose to show up and I choose to show people that unconditional love exists. Yeah. And I get to hold and embrace people that come into the studio or that I see at treatment centers and they just say, I want to hug you and can I have a hug? And I get to hold and embrace people and share 
in the pain and share in the discomfort and say that there is hope. Yeah. But that's it. That's yeah. it. That that's literally it. I don't care. I don't care if you think I'm a fraud. <laughs> I don't care. The shit that I hear about myself, the and life like, that I'm living. At the, look at the life we live. Like we say it all the time when we're together. Like it's fucking beautiful. Yeah. Like I literally look around all the time, like in my surroundings and I'm like, this isn't something I could have dreamed of for myself, but like here it is. You strip every single thing away from me. You strip the car, you strip the house, you strip the clothes, you strip the jewelry, you strip the whatever, you strip it all away from me. At the end of the day, I'll stand there strong in my truth. And there's nothing about yep. me and my authentic self that you could strip away from me because I will build it all back every single time like the phoenix. Yep. Every single time there's been so many times yeah, in my life. Yeah, we don't life, give up. We don't give up around I'll here. I'll never give up. No, we hit some serious pain, but we don't give up. I'll never give up. Yeah. I'll never stop fighting for the truth. I'll never stop fighting for the yep. underdog. I will never. I will see you and I will see your pain and I will. I'll never stop falling in love with people's potential. I think that that is like, I it's know. like people want to say that that's a character defect or a character flaw of mine where like I see the good in everyone, but I'll never stop. Because there was moments in, in my life where even though I was the shittiest of shitty people causing the most harm, there was people that saw my light. Yeah. There was people that didn't give up on me. There was people that let me sleep on their couch when I was fucking broken. Yeah. And I'll never forget those moments. Yeah. Even if they're not in my life at this time. Right? Because people go through shifts and everyone every and everything serves a purpose. Yeah. Everyone and everything. And I I made a post about it about a year ago about I am so grateful for every single person that I have spent any significant amount of time with, even if we're not friends now. I am so grateful for you and I appreciate your impact on my life and I know that everything comes and goes and flows and if you are in my life, you are in my life for a reason and if you're out of my life, you're out of my life for a reason and that's it and the energy goes where energy flows and this is all that it's about and we are forever evolving and growing yep. and sometimes you you come into people's lives and you connect and then sometimes you go out of people's lives and then you come back in people's lives and you just never know. You never know where the world is going to take There's always you. a lesson. Always a lesson. And I feel like my story was all over the place, but at the end of the day, it doesn't even matter. You guys get the idea that I have had fucking the shittiest shits and I've had the highest moments. I have, like the people that I've the met. Shittiest the shittiest shits. <laughs> the shittiest shits. The shittiest the shits. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I have a lot of GI issues because I fucking did heroin for so long. So I have had the shittiest shit. <laughs> the shittiest of shits, man. <laughs> but also the most beautiful experiences. And I mean, epic highs, yeah. Epic. 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 And like, I don't even talk about a lot of the really cool shit like DMX being at treatment centers or hanging out with Demi Lovato Ew. or meeting Trey songs in Miami. I mean, we Crazy. can go, you know, all these stories, right? Like I have all these things of all these beautiful experiences where it's just like the universe like comes down and it's like, oh, okay. Like we see you, hun. And like, this is like what's happening for you. And it's just so beautiful. I mean, Syra, she's an angel and we met because of like all these crazy different circumstances that you just like never realize, yeah. right? And you're just like, wait a minute. You reflect back and you're like, holy shit, that happened and that yeah. happened and this happened and I was doing this. I mean, But that's why you have to take the lead, get out of your comfort zone, get vulnerable yeah. and speak up. Because it lands you in these situations and in these these circumstances where you meet incredible people and incredible things happen. The world is your oyster. The world is yours. So take the lead. And don't be afraid. And don't be afraid of judge, like being judged. Yeah, all or, of it. None of that shit even matters. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I feel like we're coming into a, a time and an era where... People are seeing this. People are waking up. People are are realizing that like... No, our worth isn't in our looks and what we drive and what we wear and what we do. It's it's so much deeper than that. Yeah. 
It's it has so nothing much, to do with that. It's so much deeper than that. And I lived there. I lived there yeah. in that false reality of of thinking that it was about the looks and about the things and about what you had and where you've been and who you know and it's all fucking bullshit. It's about how you feel about yourself at the end of the day and every single day when I lay my head down on my pillow at night, I am so fucking happy with who I am that that I am so fucking unshakable in that. You sleep good and you don't have panic attacks. And trust me, there are people that are trying to take me the fuck out. Mm-hmm. Deeply, they just wish that I would. Their fucking. time will come. <laughs> their fucking time will come. I don't even want their time to come. I just want them to so deeply look in the oh mirror God, and be happy guys, with who they this are. Is the shit, like she <laughs> handles this so well, and I think just as like an outsider looking in and like seeing the impact and the shit that she goes through, it fucking infuriates me. And I just want to act like a fucking savage sometimes, but she's just like, no, nope, we're gonna. I will say it over and over and over and no, I'll say it over and over and over and over again. Hurt people hurt people. I know. So if anybody's out there trying to hurt you or trying to say hurtful things or make you feel less than or control a narrative about you and like, like whatever it is. I mean, this time last year, guys. I, I don't really talk about it, but I was getting hair follicle drug test. <laughs> I was having to send breathalyzers to people morning, oh, in the morning at 9 a.m., in the that. noon at 12 o'clock, and right before bed. I had to send videos of me sending breathalyzers she had because so I was so many being, of them too. She'd like leave I have them around them places. I'd be yeah. like, hey, you I, had left to have one, I, I would have to have a breathalyzer <laughs> at Taylor's house because I was there so much. I had to have a breathalyzer in my car. I had to have a breathalyzer at home. I had a breathalyzer at the studio just to. To make sure that I was sending these breathalyzers, fingernail drug test, hair follicle drug test. Mind you, I have not done like drugs. everyone literally thought that she was going insane because <laughs> she left her situation. Like nobody could <laughs> believe that she was really just truly so fucking unhappy that she was like damn near suicidal. That like God forbid she left on her own. Like she's definitely getting high. Like yeah. everyone just assumed that like she was in a full blown relapse and going insane because she just walked away from everything. Like, nobody wanted to take accountability for their actions. Nobody wanted to, like, see that maybe something else really was going on deeper. Like, it was just like, nope, Amy's on drugs. She fucking <laughs> left. She's on drugs. Everyone around her is on drugs. They're all so fucked up. They're on drugs. Everyone's like, manipulated by me because yeah. I'm a master manipulator. Everyone, and, yeah. and everyone's my puppet. You know, everyone that's around me is my puppet because I'm just, just crazy so shit. good at manipulating people whatever the fuck story narrative that they, they were living in so i just did these things and it's like it's insane to think that yeah. that was my reality that I was know. my reality a lot of shit's changed in a year holy shit <laughs> this time last year as i was like moving my business taking my breath like, like taking my breath work certification like just like the turning my pain into purpose and power and knowing that I deserved more, even though I was at the highest highs, right? Like I had all the things that you could possibly think like you would want and desire, right? A house in Florida, a house in Rye Beach, a house in Bedford, uh, all these things, unlimited access to all these things, doing all these things. Well, you know what? At the end of the day, money doesn't buy happiness. And at the end of the day, when your inner condition isn't reflection of your outer world, because you know, you're not being seen, valued, heard in the way that you wanted or desired and that people could only love you at the own, the level that they loved mm -hmm. and desired themselves, yeah. right? And not by anybody's fault. It's not anybody's fault. And I'll never, like I said, I'll never talk bad about anybody, but once you start growing and once you start doing this work and if people aren't growing with you, like it becomes very painful and there's this time where, you know, as you grow and exceed, there's this lonely yeah. period that you nobody talks about that like it's so lonely as these like you shed this old idea of what you thought and desired to where the new people call in and yeah. then you're just like, wait, where am I? And so many people get stuck in, in this next level of purgatory, right? Like I had this level of purgatory where I was like separating myself from the drugs and alcohol because the drugs and alcohol weren't working. And then I and then I moved into wanting the like things. The thinking, luxuries of life. Right, the bottomless void, the happiness destination 
the happiness destinations is I'll be happy when. I'll be happy when I get the kids. I'll be happy when I get the marriage. I'll be happy when I get the house. I'll be happy when I get the car. But then you get those things and the happiness destination doesn't exist because happiness comes from inside. Mm -hmm. And until you're willing to look and do the deep, dark, shitty, gritty work of being like, what is it that I need to shed? And what is it that I need to realize that there is nothing outside? There isn't a way my body's gonna look. There isn't a way that my hair is gonna look or my face is gonna look or whatever it is that's gonna make me happy and feel and be fulfilled. And sometimes people can't come with you on that journey and that's okay. And we get to be so grateful for the role that they had in your life. And, and, and I'll continue to always say every single person in my life, I am so grateful for, and I appreciate every level. And I am so sorry that you couldn't come with me. And I'm so sorry that the hurt and the turmoil that I caused in that process, because I know I'm not perfect. And I know I caused my own chaos. And I know I caused my own shit due to my own trauma. And, and deeply understanding that I'm not fucking perfect and I've admitted it yeah. and I've taken my responsibility and I've done my things and now I'm moving along because now I get to live my life and I hope every single other person that has been affected by me I'm truly deeply sorry but now it's time to also forgive and move on and completely just live your life and I'm gonna live my life and we're all just gonna live our lives cohesively hopefully right that's like the end goal right yeah. with like no with just animosity. forgiveness yeah. yeah no animosity and just forgiveness yeah and we get to just like keep it moving it's yeah the end goal we're just because that's keep what it I, moving sister and that's what i really want to ask people right is like when you're out here like doing these things like what's your end goal yep like my end goal is to like live kindly and peacefully and gracefully and unapologetically in my truth. And I just really hope everybody can go along with that same path for themselves because there's freedom in that. There's so much yeah. freedom and forgiveness and, and gratitude and kindness and loving. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> that was so good. Yeah. So I'm sure more stuff's going to come along the way and we're going to have, and I was telling Taylor cause I was talking to my friend Lauren who we grew up together. She was like in bike week with me and she's been through all the car accidents. She was behind me in the car accident and she has a beautiful story and Taylin and Kaylin. And I have all these people, right. That have like proof to these crazy ass situations that I've been in. And so we're going to have some more of these people to talk deeply about more of these situations and more of the awareness and healing that we've all grown. Cause we've all grown grown yeah. over these 10 years yeah. and Taylor's story you know next week we're going to talk about Taylor's story well, and Taylor will not have next week we have uh the author coming on oh yeah we're gonna break it up yeah and then after that it'll be Taylor and then maybe we'll invite May on some of Taylor's friends from along the way and we'll just have these open and vulnerable conversations and just you know seeing that yeah. we're all the same that's what I said in the beginning of the thing is like even though the stories are different Right. Everybody's story is uniquely theirs. But yeah. the feeling of being unheard, unseen, unvalued and unloved are all the same. Right. It's just what is the story in creating that? Yeah. And until you see yourself, hear yourself, love yourself and value yourself, you will not be heard, seen, valued or loved. It's only as deeply as you love yourself, hear yourself, value yourself and see yourself. And I, 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 it's so funny because it's like, I, I, I say it all the time right now where it's like, wow, I've never felt so valued and loved. And I tell you guys, like I tell all my people, I'm just so grateful for the thing. And, and I had this like epiphany in it all. And I was like, holy shit, these people are a reflection of me. Mm. But the truth is, is that it's only because I see myself for the first time. I hear myself for the first time and I value myself and I love myself for the first time that it's inviting these people in to do that for me. Yeah. It's all a mirror. It is. Your outer reality is a reflection of your inner reality. Yeah. That's it. I know. It's beautiful. 
It's so fucking beautiful. I feel like we say it so much. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Oh, but we're just so grateful. I'm just it so, really is. I'm so just so grateful guys. and I'm just so it's happy. Just so beautiful. We're just so loving. And it's <laughs> like we're just here to just share at the world, right? It's like it's like with the app. Like I love like this morning I woke up. I mean, this is my Monday, right? Like this morning I woke up. 444 I hit my snooze a bunch of times because you know I was in bed and I didn't really want to get up because it's Monday morning and it's a holiday and I'm like oh maybe people don't want to get on the live because it's a holiday (laughs) but it doesn't matter right like I got up I was there 6 a.m I was six it was 605 I was a little late um and I talked about vulnerability and how like being vulnerable is courageous and I talked for 40 minutes on my app and there was people on there and we're engaging and then I took a shower and I went to a mental health facility and I did a sound bowl group and everybody was so happy to see me. They were like, oh my God, Amy's here. It's the Monday because I do it every other week when I don't have my kids on Monday. And everybody was so happy to see me. And then I go to Mayflower and I do a, two groups back to back and do my sound bowls and all this stuff. And I'm just so grateful that this is my life. Like I'm just so grateful mm. that that's what I get to do. I know. That's it. That was my day. And then I end it with being here, sharing more vulnerability, more loving, more gratitude yeah. with my best friend in the space that I created, this safe healing space. Like, holy shit. I know. It's wild. Homeless, broken, thinking, purgatory, wanting to die to this. Yeah. <laughs> Epic. Epic. Epic shit. There's hope. Epic. Shit, it's so funny. Every time me and Taylor like wrap it up, and this is going to be a long podcast, but every time I text her, I'm like, I'm like holy shit, we're doing epic shit. <laughs> every week. Holy shit. Even every when week, I do breath do the work. Same shit, like, yeah. we're epic shit. Like, There's epic shit, period. <laughs> epic <laughs> shit. <laughs> it's always extended. And it's just like, it's the app is growing, the podcast is growing, the studio is growing, and it's organic. I mean, I had Sunday, I didn't even advertise for my Sunday morning class, and there was eight people here, people were just looking on Mind and Body. I had three new people. The three new people, two of the people were like, yeah, my coworker put your business card on our, like, break table. How funny is that? I love that? that. How funny is that? Like, I love that. sideways, passive-aggressive, like... Y'all, y'all should need healing. Heal. <laughs> y'all need some fucking healing. So it's going to make our work environment better, yeah, right? Yeah. Everyone just sticking my business card out on their work table. And I'm like, it's organic. It's deep rooted. Yeah. I have haters. I had some people text me and tell me to get a real job this week. I'm like, this is a real what job. What is a real job? Who knows what the fuck a real job is? I'm a fraud. That's that's really great. I hear that all the time. There's like multiple people that think like because my past, right? Which I get it. That's where I'm like when you deeply understand and you do this work of inner work, you're like when you hear these rumors about yourself, you're like, yeah, I get why people would think that I'm a fraud. I was a homeless, scandalous, stripper, drug addict, like, you know, doing all these things. So yeah, people that don't know me, I, if you have not met me in the past eight months, you should probably get to know me again because I am a completely different person. different person. Yeah. 100% cellular level deeply, completely the way my inner workings, all the work, like I have not yeah. between all the 10 years before, like this year was like the catalyst of it all where it all just like hit its head and then it was just like, it just like fell onto me of like deeply understanding what I've gone through and everything. So if you don't know me, if you have not met me in the past eight months, you actually have no idea who I am. Yeah. And I invite you because I'll gladly open arm. And we're always changing too, right? Like I'm definitely not the same person I was last year. It's evolving. We're human beings. Everyone's changing, which is another reason why relationships end. Like you either grow together, you grow apart and that's just, it's okay. It is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Grateful for everyone. So one hand on the heart, one hand on the belly. Woo! That was a good one. Woo! Ay-yo! <laughs> <laughs> Big inhale. Lift up, rise up, fill up. Exhale. Let that shit go. <sighs> no more shame. No more guilt. You're not a victim. You're a survivor. Yes. A warrior. 
a warrior, a phoenix, baby. A phoenix. We rise from the ashes. Bye. 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 See you next week. Thanks so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to listen to what we have to say. It means the world. As always, we want to end this episode by reminding you that we are not medical professionals and we are not giving any type of medical advice. We are simply sharing our experience and solutions. We are here with the intentions of reminding you that you are never alone and that everyone's healing journey is unique to the individual. Make sure to follow us on all social media platforms to stay updated. Stay well, sacred rebels. See you next time.